This is how currency is created, and what I've found is that uh, almost nobody really knows how currency is created. In the United States, the Treasury issues a bond which is nothing but an IOU, and the primary dealers, the, the biggest banks, come and show up at the Treasury auctions and buy those bonds. A few of those banks are now dead. Uh, then the Federal Reserve, through something called open market operations, will show up and either drain liquidity from the system or add liquidity to the system and they will buy some of those bonds. When they do, they write a check from a checkbook that has nothing in it and currency springs into existence, base money, paper dollars. Then the next month, those banks go back and show up at a treasury auction and buy more bonds. So what ends up happening is you have this buildup of bonds at the treasury and base money, uh, bonds at the Federal Reserve and base money at the Treasury, and then the government will do some deficit spending, and uh, the government employees, the soldiers, uh, the con government contractors will deposit that in the commercial banks, your banks. Now, you, the, fraction, the miracle of fractional reserve lending comes into play. You create a loan by taking a portion of the, that depositor's currency um, I'm going to use a 10% reserve ratio as an example here because it's easy math. So somebody deposits 100 rubles. You borrow 90 of that out of their account and you loan it to somebody. And that person buys something, a house or a car or whatever. The seller then deposits that into his bank account. Uh, and so now there are 190 rubles in existence. Then uh, that bank takes 90% of that deposit and loans them out. And now there are uh, 200, 271 rubles in existence. And this process repeats and repeats. And under a 10% reserve ratio, uh, it's possible. Uh, you wouldn't do this because you wouldn't push your balance sheets right to the edge uh, because you could get shut down. But uh, if you go right out to the reserve ratio and the reserve ratio is 10%, a uh, hundred dollars, a hundred rubles can create a thousand by you guys. Uh, so that's it. That's the currency supply. It's a couple of bucks that was whipped up in this uh, scam here, I call it, where they swap IOUs. A bond is an IOU. Loan me a trillion bucks. I promise to pay you back two trillion in 30 years. A check is an IOU. Here's my check. You can go to the bank and pick up cash. So they swap IOUs. Currency springs into existence. You guys get to magnify it, and you guys get to get rich off of this system, so it's really a good system for you. This system does transfer wealth from the population to the government and the banking system continually. Uh, so it's the, the whole currency system is a couple of bucks whipped up by that system, and then a bunch of numbers that you guys type into your computers when you create loans. It's just credits and debits on the books. The crisis is going to start in the United States, though. But anyway, in the United States, we have to work for some of that currency supply so that we can save it up so that we can pay tax. We pay that to the tax collector called the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service then turns it over to the Treasury so the Treasury can pay the in principal plus the interest on that bond that was uh, purchased with a check from nothing. So all of this, the value of the currency comes from all the labor and ideas and talent of the people right here. This is what actually gives it value. And because there was uh, interest due on that bond, and there is interest due on every single one of these loans, there is always more debt than there is currency to pay the debt. In the United States, we have about $14 trillion, but we have $60 trillion to, of debt to pay with that 14. It's impossible. This system cannot go on forever. It's eventually finite. Eventually, interest will start out stripping the amount that you're borrowing into existence every month, and the thing just goes into a hyperinflation eventually. So, because there's interest due on this bond, and it's paid out of taxes, every paper dollar, every paper ruble in existence is a promise to tax us until the day we die, at least in the United States. You don't pay a lot of income tax here. But in the United States, every dollar in existence is a promise to tax us until the day we die because it's borrowed into existence and it's all promised back. The entire currency supply is owed back plus interest. So 
the U.S. monetary base. It took 200 years to go from zero dollars to 825 billion dollars in existence. Then along came the financial crisis of 2008 and Ben Bernanke wrote a bunch of checks to bail out the banks and when he did, base money was created. We created more currency in just 18 months than the last 200 years. Do you think that's a good thing? I don't. But that's the base money. That's the portion of the currency supply that the government creates and, and the central bank. Uh, that only accounted for 7% of the currency supply before the crisis. Now it accounts for about 15. This is the portion of the currency supply that you guys create, at least in the United States, that the banks create. It's called, the rest of M3 is, is base money plus this. Now something is happening here that is ringing alarm bells and it's saying that there's a crisis coming. If we deduct base money from the M3, what you see is that there's a collapse of the currency supply. This is the first time since the Great Depression the currency supply is collapsing. It's collapsed by over a trillion dollars. This is people getting scared and they save up and they pay down debt instead of borrowing more currency into existence each month, they're extinguishing it by paying off their loans. So this is the way a debt-based currency system works. Okay. Okay. You keep on promising to pay more debt uh, than you're borrowing your currency into existence and every month there's a payment due, whether it's the bond, whether it's uh, the uh, uh, loans to you, and as long as the public feels good and borrows more in existence, the economy grows, the banking sector grows, people feel good. But there, sometimes when things get bad, people get scared and they start saving and paying off debt. And then a debt-based currency system can literally implode. It's that simple. It really is that simple. It's made complex by all of these rules and regulations and stuff. And it it uh, creates a smoke screen so you can't really see what's going on. Maybe that's a little overdramatic. Maybe the dollar will not implode. But I do know this, every 30 to 40 years the world has an entirely new monetary system. This one is now 39 years old and getting older and it's developing cracks, it's developing instabilities. This is what you are seeing right now. By the end of this decade, the dollar as it exists today will no longer exist. It'll either be a different dollar or we'll have some sort of world currency, but we will no longer be on the worldwide dollar standard. This is the S&P 500 in the United States, the British stock market, the German stock market, and you see they all track each other except Singapore used to trade differently. The Nikkei, Japan, used to trade differently. It, it wouldn't always go up when the U.S. Stock, stock market was going up. It would trade in opposite directions, but in about the year 2000, they all started trading the same. Brazil just started trading with the U.S. in the same direction in uh, 2008, and guess what? So did Russia. Wherever the U.S. goes, you go, and so does the rest of the world. This is the first, uh, oh, this is the first ruble. Ruble goes back 500 years. It was devalued 10,000 to 1, then 100 to 1, then 50,000 to 1, then 10 to 1, 10 to 1, and 1,000 to 1. Well, we are on the seventh ruble right now. The total devaluation the ruble has been devalued five quadrillion times. This is wealth being transferred from the population to the government. The world has a new monetary system every 30 to 40 years, the classical gold standard, where every unit of currency in existence, every dollar, every British pound and so on, was backed by an equivalent amount of gold at, their, at the treasury. Then World War I came along. You can I'm done in two seconds. I'm done in five, thirty seconds. Okay. Uh, then the gold exchange standard. Then the Bretton Woods system, where all currencies on the planet were backed by the U.S. dollar, with the exception of just a few. But almost all currencies were backed by the U.S. dollar, and the dollar was pegged to gold at thirty-five dollars an ounce. And foreign central banks 
could come to the Federal Reserve and change those dollars for gold at $35 an ounce, effectively pegging every currency on earth to gold through the U.S. dollar. 1971 comes along and basically we had printed too many dollars, receipts for gold. We didn't have enough gold to back it up. Nixon takes us off of the gold standard. And on that day, August 15th, 1971, all the world's currencies became pieces of paper with numbers on them and nothing more. It's called a fiat currency. It has no intrinsic value. So 30 to 40 years, 30 years, 28 years, 39 years plus, what's next? The ruble has a crisis every now and then. Every currency on, the, on earth has. Why do you think the dollar is so stable? Why do you think the dollar isn't susceptible to a major currency crisis? I believe it is. I believe we're going on a new currency crisis. It's going to happen. We're going on a new monetary system. It's going to happen in this decade. You should finish. Okay, I'm done. That's it. Uh, um, I had a movie for you. Sorry you couldn't see it. Our whole monetary system borrows prosperity from the future so that we can spend it today. When we do a bailout, we're borrowing more prosperity out of the future just to prop up these zombie companies and zombie banks. And what that does is all that prosperity is owed back, just like our entire currency supply of the planet. It is all owed back plus interest. That means our prosperity is owed back plus interest.